what we're going to do is actually just flash a series of photos behind me that show you the reality of robots used in war right now or already at the prototype stage. It's just to give you a taste. Another way of putting it is you're not going to see anything that's powered by Vulcan technology or teenage, teenage wizard hormones or anything like that. This is all real. So why don't we go ahead and start those pictures. Something big is going on in war today and maybe even the history of humanity itself. The US military went into Iraq with a handful of drones in the air. We now have 5,300. We went in with zero unmanned ground systems. We now have 12,000. And the tech term killer application takes on new meaning in this space. And we need to remember that we're talking about the Model T Fords, the right flyers compared to what's coming soon. That's where we're at right now. One of the people that I recently met with was an Air Force three-star general. And he said, basically, where we're headed very soon is tens of thousands of robots operating in our conflicts. And these numbers matter because we're not just talking about tens of thousands of today's robots, but tens and thousands of these prototypes and tomorrow's robots. Because, of course, one of the things that's operating in technology is Moore's Law, that you can pack in more and more computing power into those robots. And so flash forward around 25 years, if Moore's Law holds true, those robots will be close to a billion times more powerful in their computing than today. And so what that means is the kind of things that we used to only talk about at science fiction conventions like Comic-Con have to be talked about in the halls of power, in places like the Pentagon. A robot's revolution is upon us. Now, I need to be clear here. I'm not talking about a revolution where you have to worry about the governor of California showing up at your door, all of the Terminator. When historians look at this period, they're going to conclude that we're at a different type of revolution, a revolution in war, like the invention of the atomic bomb. But it may be even bigger than that, because our unmanned systems don't just affect the how of war fighting. They affect the who of fighting at its most fundamental level. That is, every previous revolution in war, be it the machine gun, be it the atomic bomb, was about a system that either shot faster, went further, had a bigger boom, that's certainly the case with robotics, but they also change the experience of the warrior and even the very identity of the warrior. Another way of putting this is that mankind's 5,000-year-old monopoly on the fighting of war is breaking down in our very lifetime. I spent the last several years going around meeting with all the players in this field, from the robot scientists to the science fiction authors who inspired them, to the 19-year-old drone pilots who are fighting from Nevada, to the four-star generals who command them, to even the Iraqi insurgents who they are targeting and what they think about our systems. And what I found interesting is not just their stories, but how their experiences point to these ripple effects that are going outwards in our society, in our law, in our ethics, et cetera. And so what I'd like to do with my remaining time is basically flesh out a couple of these. So the first is that the future of war, even a robotics one, is not going to be purely an American one. The US is currently ahead in military robotics right now. But we know that in technology, there's no such thing as a permanent first mover advantage. You know, quick show of hands, how many people in this room still use Wang computers? It's the same thing in war. The British and the French invented the tank. The Germans figured out how to use it right. And so what we have to think about for the US is that we are ahead right now, but you have 43 other countries out there working on military robotics. And they include all the interesting countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran. And this raises a bigger worry for me. How do we move forward in this revolution given the state of our manufacturing and the state of our science and mathematics training in our schools? Or another way of thinking about this is, what does it mean to go to war increasingly with soldiers whose hardware is made in China and software is written in India? But just as software has gone open source, so has warfare. Unlike an aircraft carrier and atomic bomb, you don't need a massive manufacturing system to build robotics. A lot of it's off the shelf. A lot of it's even do-it-yourself. One of those things that you just saw flash before you was a Raven drone, the handheld tossed one. For about $1,000, you can build one yourself, equivalent to what the soldiers use in Iraq. That raises another wrinkle when it comes to war and conflict. Good guys might play around and work on these as hobby kits, but so might bad guys. This cross between robotics and things like terrorism is going to be fascinating and even disturbing. 
And we've already seen it start. During the war between Israel, a state, and Hezbollah, a non-state actor, the non-state actor flew four different drones against Israel. There's already a jihadi website that you can go on and remotely detonate an IED in Iraq while sitting at your home computer. And so I think what we're going to see is two trends take place with this. First is you're going to reinforce the power of individuals against governments. But then the second is that we are going to see an expansion in the realm of terrorism. The future of it may be a cross between Al-Qaeda 2.0 and the next generation of the Unabomber. And another way of thinking about this is the fact that, remember, you don't have to convince a robot that they're going to receive 72 virgins after they die to convince them to blow themselves up. But the ripple effects of this are going to go out into our politics. One of the people that I met was, was a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Ronald Reagan, and he put it this way, quote, I like these systems because they save American lives, but I worry about more marketization of wars, more shock and awe talk to defray discussion of the costs. People are more likely to support the use of force if they view it as costless. Robots, for me, take certain trends that are already in play in our body politic and maybe take them to their logical ending point. We don't have a draft. We don't have declarations of war anymore. We don't buy war bonds anymore. And now we have the fact that we're converting more and more of our American soldiers that we would send into harm's way into machines. And so we may take those already lowering bars to war and drop them to the ground. But the future of war is also going to be a YouTube war. That is, our new technologies don't merely remove humans from risk, they also record everything that they see. So they don't just delink the public, they reshape its relationship with war. There's already several thousand video clips of combat footage from Iraq on YouTube right now, most of it gathered by drones. Now, this could be a good thing. It could be building connections between the home front and the war front as never before. But remember, this is taking place in our strange, weird world. And so inevitably, the ability to download these video clips to you know, your iPod or your Zune gives you the ability to turn it into entertainment. Soldiers have a name for these clips. They call it war porn. A typical one that I was sent was an email that had an attachment of video of a predator strike taking out an enemy site, missile hits, bodies burst into air at the explosion. It was set to music. It was set to the pop song, I Just Want to Fly by Sugar Ray. This ability to watch more 